for auditing Professor Sky's record review. The only first listen new music review show hosted by a French professor immediately after making chocolate chip cookies for his family. Today I'm going to be reviewing Built to Spill plays the songs of Daniel Johnson. And this is going to be what I call an outsider review. That's part of the reason I'm outside now. It's a bad pun, but I don't care. You will hear the sound of my neighbor's eternal lawnmower. I don't, it's like sunset. I don't know how they're mowing their lawns now, but it doesn't matter. Let me tell you why I'm an outsider. You see, I am a French professor. I'm not a music expert. I have heard of Built to Spill, but I've never listened to one second of their music. I have heard of Daniel Johnson. I have never listened to a single second of his music. The question I pose to you is, will my review have any value to you whatsoever? Why are you watching this? What could I possibly bring to this conversation? I do five minutes of research before every single video. I happen to see there's a Pitchfork review. I am positive the Pitchfork review is going to be more informative and more useful for you than this video. I'm sure they know all about Built to Spill, that they're from, let me see my notes, Idaho. That's cool, they, they got a lead singer guy. Uh, it's like Gretsch or Grunch or Gorsuch, or Gramophone, something with a G. They've been around forever, I've heard of them. They're the kind of band where people say, oh, do you like Built to Spill? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not like super into them, but yeah, yeah. And then in the back of your head, you're like, I've never heard them. I'm sure they're great, but I knew nothing about them. Daniel Johnson is vaguely aware of him because I am a child of the 90s. I remember everything Kurt Cobain did mattered. So he wore a shirt of a Daniel Johnson album and I remember seeing it and thinking, oh man, that's cool. I never listened to a single second of Daniel Johnson's music because of that. I've also never heard Flipper. Is Flipper good? I don't know. Kurt Cobain made them cool, but I was enough of a Kurt Cobain fan to know that he would look down on me for listening to that music just because he was wearing a t-shirt. So ultimately, it led to me never listening to Daniel Johnson. Turns out he's like this outsider musician who made like 10 albums completely outside of the, of the machine, completely outside of any kind of major label. I guess he had an offer to, to make, to like sign with a record label and he refused it because they had Metallica who was aligned with Satan in his mind. So he's crazy, apparently. I guess he died last year. Maybe that's why this album came out. I don't know. I'm an outsider. I don't know anything about this album. I'm a French professor wearing an apron that says foodie on it. Do you know how embarrassing it is to be wearing an apron that says foodie on it? Do you know how little you have to think of yourself? to wear an apron that says foodie, but I am. And I don't know, I assume that's why. So when I get this album, I go, you know what, screw it. I'm just gonna review it. I listened to the first track, I liked it, I was in. I know that Built to Spill is important. They happened to come out after I was in my mid 20s. I talk all the time about mid 20s music death. If I was 10 years younger, I would know everything about Built to Spill, I'm sure of it but I didn't listen to them because they were some new band and I didn't care. And Daniel Johnson, based on what I just said, sounds amazing. Sounds like, based on the music that I hear in this album, he's a great songwriter. He must have done some really interesting things. So I don't know. I'm gonna review this album and probably get a sunburn and, and go crazy if that lawnmower doesn't turn off. And I am going to be an outsider. If Daniel Johnson is, as my five minutes of research tell me, known and appreciated for his purity and innocence. Could there be anything more pure and innocent than this review? I know nothing. I don't know if this is a wonderful selection from Johnson's career, spanning his early days up until his death. I don't know if this is all just one album. I just have the music. And maybe that's the most interesting review you can get. Maybe you don't need any kind of metatextual reference to where does this fit in the, the Built to Spill category or how does this relate to other covers of Daniel Johnson. I am going to tell you with ears as new as the freshly fallen snow what this album is like. Why did I reference snow when I'm sweating? I don't know. I'll give you an idea of the basic way this album works. You know, I like to talk about the equations. So taking this album just as it is, okay? 
it seems that it's put together very quickly, very lo-fi, but not like intentionally lo-fi, just like maybe they did one or two takes. You got an acoustic guitar usually, an electric guitar, some tremolo, uh, a voice with like a chorus effect or maybe a double effect on it that's kind of sometimes, actually quite often, a little bit too low in the mix so you can't quite hear. Simple bass, simple drums, very simple songwriting. Very, very simple all the way throughout. It's rough. Sorry, I'm moving my notes. There's also a lot of wind out here. Windy and I'm getting a sunburn. I'm complaining a lot today. Things are good. I made really good chocolate chip cookies, actually. Uh, it's rough and it's pleasant. And the thing I kept thinking about, the name that kept on coming back and back and back, is if you told me this was an album of covers of Buddy Holly songs that he never released, I would have believed you. This album is very, very Buddy Holly-esque. And it made me realize, if you wanted to make music that sounds like Buddy Holly now or in the 90s or in the 80s, you have to be crazy. <laughs> you have to be an outsider. You have to be schizophrenic or whatever led him to living, uh, living in an asylum for most of his life. Like, that strength, that purity of Buddy Holly's music just doesn't have anywhere in our modern music society. If, if you were to try to make music like that now, and you did it, and you were a, like a fully functioning, like totally capable person, aware of all the trends in music and rock and roll and computers and genres and all that, what would come out would not be Buddy Holly. You'd be something else. You'd be something maybe better, but it wouldn't be this. So the feeling that I got from this album is that it is this indie singer paying great tribute to somebody and really allowing his songs to come out and to play his songs and to love his songs. It's a very enjoyable album. I listen to it on repeat all day. So it's sunset now. Oh my God, is it sunny out. Whoa, I might actually move into the shade. This is, this is rough like a cat's tongue. Uh, it's very enjoyable. And uh, I, could, I listened to it on repeat all day and I never got tired of it. The thing it actually reminded me of, and I, I am gonna move into the shade. No one, as, as my daughter says, no one wants sun cancer. <laughs> That's her term. Whew, all right. Unfortunately, you won't be seeing me sweat the whole time. <sighs> the thing that it reminded me of, the thing this album reminded me of the most, not stylistically, but spiritually, is Nilsson Sings Newman. So Harry Nilsson was a singer-songwriter from LA who, in like 1970, produced an album of covers of the then barely known singer-songwriter from LA, Randy Newman. And what he ended up doing was taking his voice, and Nilsson's voice is gorgeous, maybe the best voice in the history of pop music, maybe, before he destroyed it, and then he took Newman's songwriting, Newman, one of the better songwriters in pop history, and mixed them together. Because Nilsson's songwriting is great, but sometimes it gets a little formulaic. Randy Newman's voice is very distinctive, but actually quite annoying. And if you don't know what I'm talking, right? That album was able to do something special by being somebody who I didn't know about, covering someone else who I didn't know about, they made an album that made me go out and explore more about Nilsson and more about Newman. That's what this album does for me. I would like to know more about Built to Spill. I would like to know more about Daniel Johnson. You could, if you'd like, put in the comments, hey, if you're really into Daniel Johnson, probably the best album to listen to is blank. And then tell me, I want to know. Same thing with Built to Spill because Whatever this project is, it's clearly a project of love and it's a project that's very well done. It strikes this perfect tone of like, like I said, rough and pleasant. So it's not overproduced, but it's not so raw that it feels like you can't eat it. You can't listen to it. I had to put the cookies in for an extra minute because we have a terrible, terrible stove. So now I'm gonna go kind of track by track just to give you a little bit of an idea. Uh, it opens up with a song called Bloody Rainbow, which I assume must be part of what makes Daniel Johnson so appealing. This kind of poetic phrase, Bloody Rainbow, is so unsettling, uh, it makes you mad. Like, it actually makes you feel like you are losing your mind. Just say it at home. Go ahead. No one's listening. Say the words, Bloody Rainbow. Yeah. 
Gi. All of this, all of these words, which again are kind of swallowed, like I don't quite hear them well enough. That's my biggest complaint about the album. I wish you could hear the lyrics more clearly. Um, but it's just so unsettling. Filled to the brim, bloody rainbow, with these very, very 50s chord progression. Very interesting song. Leads me on to Tell Me Now. This is where I realized after two songs what an amazingly 50s sounding album this is. This is where I got that whole Buddy Holly concept. Uh, the lyrics were just very clear. Uh, at least clearer. And it's a nice conflicted song about trying to figure out what does the, your lover feel or someone who you'd like to be your lover. The next track, Honey, I, uh, I Sure Miss You, shows a little bit more vocal range. And this is where uh, my ignorance is bad because I don't know how Daniel Johnson sang. Did he have a lot of range? Does Gertchenbacher from Built to Spill have a lot of range? I don't know, but this song is really quite nice. It has kind of like a plodding guitar that, that pushes a lot. Uh, the last verse is a nice change, like stylistically drops out a bit. Good Morning You is a little bit more dynamic, a little more rocking. Um, I'm tempted to play this one for I'm gonna play a different song for you to get to play you an example. Heart, Mind, and Soul has the most catchy chorus. This is kind of an oh ho ho chorus. The lyrics seem interesting. He switches between first person and second person. And the whole time, and this is the problem, right? Even doing five minutes of research completely, completely tinged the way that I hear this album. If I had just listened to it without even knowing that the person who wrote all the music uh, spent much of his life in a very, very unwell state of mental, mental, you know, mental health, mental illness, I would have interpreted the album much differently. But because of that little piece, that little biographical piece of information, I interpret everything through that lens. So when he changes from, when he talks about talking to you in first person to second person, it's like, is he talking about himself? I don't know. Then we have the track Life in Vain, which is such a delightfully sad title. Life in Vain. That's just terrible. I mean, that's an existential howl if I ever heard one. I'm gonna play you 14 seconds of this, and you can hear the sound, the, the simplicity, the, the nice singing. Uh, there's a nice kind of guitar line, which hopefully I'm able to play a little bit of for you here, and that leads into the singing, uh, and just gives you an idea of what, of what this album is all like. Um, the other day, I, I was listening to it, and my daughter said, this all sounds the same. I said, okay. But if you're gonna be a music reviewer and you like the album, when everything sounds the same, you go, it's very stylistically consistent. It strikes an atmosphere and maintains that atmosphere from the beginning through to the end. If you don't like it, you just say, it's monotonous. So that's a little lesson. I would say, this strikes a consistent tone because I enjoy it. Here, if you don't have too much competition from the outsider, so I'm doing it outside. That's so stupid, Sky. Okay. And much like the rest of the album, it, it really doesn't feel different than most 90s alternative rock, right? Like it doesn't actually, so I'm having so much trouble with my notes today. Is this the most annoying video I've ever done? I think it might be, it's all right. At least the dogs aren't barking, but everyone likes the dogs. Uh, like the next track as well, Mountaintop, it feels the same way where it's like this, it, it feels as though it's just a straight 90s rock album. With a, with a 50s throwback. I just mentioned my dogs. That would have been a good time to mention the next song, Queenie the Dog. This is where I wonder, and I don't know, are all of Daniel Johnson's songs extremely biographical, autobiographical? Is this like, did he actually have a dog named Queenie and this is about it? Or, I am losing my mind, this wind. I'm talking like Jason Bateman. Okay, I even have like a, this is the most annoying video I've ever done. I apologize, but you're 14 minutes in and you're still watching, so that's your fault. Uh, Queenie the Dog, it seems to be a song just about a dog that passed. And again, 
songs about dogs that died are, it's a great idea and we don't do it and we don't allow our musicians to do it. It's kind of like making music that sounds like Buddy Holly. It's like you, you have to have an innocence, a childlike innocence to be permitted to do things that are childlike and wonderful. And that's a serious problem, actually. I think in our culture, we need to stop pushing so hard that in order to do anything simple or childish, you have to be somehow mentally impaired. Like, I wish anybody could write a song like Queenie the Dog, because it's a great song. And it ends with the theme that money can't save her. Impossible Love is another kind of Indies 90 track. And then we get to fake records of rock and roll. This song is amazing, just excellent. It's kind of like a Neil Youngish sounding song, like kind of a hard rock thing, and it's just angry at fake rock and roll. And that's the thing. How great is it to have somebody who's an outsider, who never really made it, who is basically known for not being a part of the system, looking at system rock and just saying, these are fake records of rock and roll. And he even said that it's been that way since the music died. And when I heard that, I was like, wait, what does he mean since the music died? Oh, since Buddy Holly died. Hey, my theory came true. Maybe it's a whole thing in Daniel Johnson's studies that he loved Buddy Holly. I don't know, this is my first time listening. Uh, the last track, Fish, is the best voice on, is the best usage of voice on the album. He has this like vulnerability and strength, which is always my favorite characteristic in any singer. Uh, it actually reminded me of Kurt Cobain at times, the way that he was singing here. And it's just a really nice, beautiful song. So there's the whole album. It's very good, very enjoyable, it makes me want to learn about both. It's Nilsson and Newman for 2020. And it's also, and this is a real side tangent, a little bit like the movie Welcome to Marwen. Okay. You probably didn't see that movie. It's a Robert Zemeckis movie starring Steve Carell about some guy who has PTSD and plays with dolls. But it's based on a real person and that real person makes interesting art with the dolls. And it's the kind of conundrum of all outsider art, right? So outsider art exists in art, in music, movies, everywhere. That when you're prizing somebody for being an outsider, whether because of their, their race or their upbringing or their education or their mental capacity, like there's an infantilizing that goes on and there's a sort of fetishizing and a romanticizing of their outsiderness. But this album doesn't do that. And I think Welcome to Marwan doesn't either. It just sort of says, here's a hurt person who is doing something interesting, and here's a little bit about their life. I think that did, for that artist, a little bit what Built to Spill has done for this artist. But that's a real... If I didn't lose you with moving around the, the, the stand, I've lost you now because no one watched that movie, but it was really good. Okay, well, now that I've made cookies, I now have to figure out dinner. I should have done it the other way around, but it was a rough day. Okay, well, until next time, uh, for, oh, please tell me again, what should I listen to for Built to Spill and Daniel Johnson? Because I want to know. All right, until next time, there's the camera.